Chastity? Isn't that like the name of a girl I once met in high school that I dated? Chastity. Oh yeah, that's the belt that you wear to like keep yourself from having fun because we've got to be medieval, right? Yeah. Chastity. Oh yeah, that's the thing that monks and nuns do. And that's why they wear that ugly clothing because they like got to be ugly all the time and they like can't be attractive or have fun like ever. Once there was a monk who lived on Mount Athos, and this monk used to drink to the point of drunkenness every single day, so that he completely scandalized all the pilgrims that visited. Well, that monk eventually died, and the pilgrims were so relieved that this, this scandal uh, had been taken away from them. And they approached one of the elders by the name of Paisios and said, we are so happy, we're so glad that this scandalous problematic monk is gone from this holy place. Elder Paisios responded to them that he knew exactly who they were speaking about because he saw a whole battalion of angels coming down and taking the soul of this monk to heaven. Of course, the pilgrims replied with some confusion, no, no, Elder Paisios, uh, we don't think that you, you know who we're speaking about. We're actually speaking about the monk who would get drunk and would scandalize us every day. And Elder Paisios replied, yes, I am speaking about the same person. And then he proceeded to tell them the story of this monk. This monk grew up in Asia Minor and at a time when the invaders uh, from Turkey uh, had come in and were dealing with the young boys and so as not to take the young boys from their parents. They would take them out and would give them a drop of alcohol to calm them and to enable them to sleep and not to cry. And from his childhood, this monk uh, learned alcoholism completely against his will, but he was addicted to it nonetheless. And eventually, as that young boy grew up, he found an elder to whom he confessed and uh, from whom he asked advice. And that elder told the young man, why don't you pray and fast every day and especially beg the Panagia the Most Holy Theotokos, the Mother of God, for the, for the grace from God, from her Divine Son, to reduce maybe to one glass less every day. And eventually that young boy became a monk and gradually throughout his life reduced the glasses from what had originally been 20 glasses of alcohol every day to one less, to 19. Eventually, to the end of his life on Mount Athos, he was only drinking to two or three. So what the pilgrims had seen, Elder Paisios explained to them, was a scandalous monk who got drunk every day. But what God saw in this monk was a fighter, someone who had started off from a much worse place in his life, but who had gotten up every day who prayed, who fasted, who made prostrations and expressed penance and repentance to the point that he gradually conquered his sins day by day, year by year for the rest of his life. And there was notable improvement in the rest of his life. Now imagine that you and I treated every part of our lives in the same way. Imagine that we took our greatest sin the one to which perhaps we might be addicted and started to undo those knots every day with the same technique, with the same devotion and with the same spirit as this elder monk from Mount Athos whose soul the holy elder Paisio saw being taken up to heaven by a battalion of angels. Imagine that you and I experience the same thing. So today, I want to talk about one or actually two of the commandments that I think our Western culture really needs to start doing this with. And that's the sixth and the ninth commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Now too often, we Catholics 
look at the uh, pit and the depth of sin that many of us, perhaps in this culture, fall into. We seem to be in a downward spiral of ever-increasing depths uh, with regards to these two sins. But what I want to do is I want to turn the glass the other way and look at it with the spirit of a fighter. And the spirit of a fighter looks at conquering these sins to achieve a goal, to achieve a dignity, to achieve a peace that only God can offer. Because as St. Augustine of Hippo said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So the gift that he offers us is the final goal of peace and communion with him. And the sin prevents us from experiencing that peace. So let's look at the goal. Let's look at the gift that God gives us expressed in these two commandments. God is a God of love. God is love, the New Testament teaches us. God is also a God of communion, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is one in three. God is a communion in and of himself. And when he made humanity, he made humanity to exist in the same way. He made us male and he made us female. Neither one of those is fully human in him or herself, but both together are human in view of one another. And also the way that God made you is a being of communion. God gave you a body and God gave you a spiritual side, a soul. And they're both made to live in communion with one another, the body for the soul and the soul for the body. And that means that you have to focus on the goodness of both, not just what's on the inside, not just what's on the outside, but what's good for both of those two things. And this is exactly what the virtue of chastity is. Chastity is explained in many, many ways by people all around our culture, but it's so often misunderstood because so many people look at chastity with a tunnel vision, with a very minimalistic view. Chastity is what prevents me from experiencing something that I want, something that I think I might enjoy. But chastity actually is a call to total greatness and peace and communion with God. Chastity is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church calls an apprenticeship in self-mastery. Remember that monk from Mount Athos? He was an apprentice his whole life, and his whole life was devoted to mastering himself. In other words, he was striving for the virtue of chastity. That's what you and I are called to do. And chastity is a call to train ourselves in achieving one thing, freedom, complete freedom, from all that could enslave us, from all the addiction of sin, from all of those pits, those deep pits, those deep wells that drag us down rather than liberate us to do that for which we were made. And finally, the Catechism teaches us very beautifully that the virtue of chastity enables you to make a gift of yourself to another. Chastity is about you in relation, in communion with somebody else, with other people. So if there's one thing I can promise you is that chastity is a lifelong struggle and there's never going to be a time in your life when you can positively say, I have completely conquered that virtue. It doesn't affect me anymore. For the vast majority of the human race, it's something that they'll have to work on for the rest of their lives. And it's something that the Catechism teaches us builds society. It's not something just to perfect you, but when you perfect yourself, you perfect your culture and your society, your city, your state, your country, and your world all around you. So your chastity will be expressed in two main forms of relationship. With your friends. It's wonderful to have good and healthy friends of both sexes. When you're chaste with them, you're life-giving, you're selfless, you're devoted, you're helpful, and you're loving with your friends. It's what builds strong and devoted friendships. But in a very special way, we know that God has created male and female for one another. And the virtue of chastity is expressed in the holy bonds of matrimony. Male and female coming together two flesh 
into a unit, into a single unit devoted entirely to one another. And that conjugal union of male and female has two sides to it. It has a physical side and a spiritual side. And chastity has to do with both of them, not just the physical. It starts there, yes, because you train your soul by training your body just as you would train yourself to play a sport or to speak a language or to play a musical instrument. But you train your body so that one day your soul can be united with it and can learn from the chastity of your body and the other way. You train your soul in the virtue of chastity so that your body can imbibe that virtue and express it in your body. And this is why the fathers of the church said so beautifully and so clearly that the marriage bed is undefiled. You know, so many people in our culture look to us Christians as somehow anti-sex, anti-sexuality, anti-physical expression of love. It's totally the opposite. We are so fulfilled in this expression because we hold everything together. God and creation, male and female, body and soul, physical and spiritual. Our joy is even more complete than if we were to take just the joy of one or the other by itself. Now because God teaches us marriage is a covenant and covenant involves sacrifice, guess what? If you want to be chaste, if you want to excel in that virtue, you have to learn sacrifice. You have to be willing to imitate Christ on the cross. And he said, greater love has no man than to give his life for his friends. He was teaching us the virtue of sacrifice. And if you want to be virtuous in any way, especially chaste, you have to learn to say, right now, this is not about me. Right now, this is about you, the one I love my spouse, or in another kind of love, you, my friend, who I'm helping, or in another kind of love still, you, my Lord, to whom I pledge everything, my entire life and my devotion. If you want to excel in that virtue, you have to learn sacrifice.